everyone and welcome to the latest Down the Rabbit Hole interview. Today we're going to be talking to speech and language expert Diane Newbury. So before we begin, Diane, if you can just introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you do as well. My name is Diane Newbury and I'm a senior lecturer and researcher at Oxford Brookes University in the UK. And my research is interested in genetic contributions to speech and language development. So what are kind of developmental language disorders and can you just provide us with some kind of examples of what of what these are and some of the symptoms that these um, patients have as well? Yeah, so I'm, as I said, we're interested in genetic contributions to how people learn and develop and use speech and language. And one way that we look at that is to look at children who have difficulties developing speech and language with the idea that there might be something slightly different about them that can explain how the rest of us or everybody learns um, speech and language. Um, so the children who we look at have something called developmental language disorder or DLD. And this is a relatively common disorder. It affects about 5% of um, children in the UK. But yet very few people have heard of it. If you compare it with something like autism or dyslexia that people have heard of, developmental language disorder, they haven't really heard of so much. And it, I think that um, shows that it's it, it's kind of almost like a hidden thing, really, that all children go through different phases of speech and language development. So there'll be um, so children who have developmental language disorder might use speech and language in a way that you think is a bit young for their actual age, but you that doesn't necessarily trigger any bells. Um, but then they also struggle understanding what's said to them. And again, that can be a very hard thing to pick up because they learn to compensate for that and to I don't know, follow things in a different way from how other children might be, say, in the classroom. So it can be a really hard thing for someone to spot. But essentially, they have difficulty. They'll use quite immature language, um, but will struggle with kind of putting together complex sentences complex ideas and expressing those and that will continue throughout their life so it's not just a childhood thing um, and then also have difficulty understanding kind of complex instructions so I quite often think of it like you know when you learn a foreign language um, and you have set phrases and set ways that you can say things and you go into a shop and you ask for something and you're quite happy with that and you can follow the conversation as long as someone sticks to the scripts. But if someone, if you then realize you need something and you don't know the word for it, or someone deviates from that script that's in your head, um, then you can, it can get very, the use of the language can get very hard very quickly. And I always think that must be what it's like for children with DLD, that as long as the language follows the script and follows the way that they, that they is at the level that they can cope with in or that are expecting. But as soon as something unexpected happens, it can be very hard for them to, they can get very lost very quickly. Is it something that's quite hard to, to diagnose? Because as, as you mentioned, you mentioned like dyslexia and I think of other conditions like Tourette's and things. And I feel like they're quite, obviously they go like missed sometimes, but I feel like sometimes these conditions are quite, there is like a criteria or something that you can be like, okay, do you have these these symptoms? But for this, I feel like it's kind of obscure. And do people kind of go late throughout life and not realise they actually even have it? Or is it something that is kind of picked up in, in childhood? Yes. So some, most children will get diagnosed either that their parents will be concerned about their language development and so will, they'll get referred to a speech and language therapist. Um, but they tend to be the children who have these expressive so problems with the language use. The ones that are really hidden are those children who have problems understanding um, language because um, it is quite hidden away and you can't see what they're thinking. So it can be um, quite that can be quite hard to diagnose. The other problems with diagnosis is that the actual problems that the individual has will change throughout their life. So at any one time point, there's not like one thing that you can say, yep, that's that means you have developmental language disorder. So it can be very different from one child to the next child um, as 
the ways that we use language are very different. The way that you use language and the way that I use language are going to be very different between us. And developmental language disorders are very different from one individual to the next. So it can be really hard to spot and really hard to definitively say, yes, that is the issue. And then even when you do get the diagnosis, we don't know, we can't, that doesn't explain why you might be having these difficulties. Um, because we, we don't understand how individuals learn to use speech and language and why some individuals might struggle with that more than others. Yeah. Why kind of in, in general is studying speech and language so, so important and how does that kind of like impact human health? I think it impacts, um, it Im impacts everything we do. If you think you had to go through a, through a whole day without saying anything, that would be a very difficult <laughs> thing to do. Now imagine that you couldn't understand anything. And, and again, I use that kind of foreign language analogy. You know, if you've been abroad to a, a place where you just don't know anything um, about the speech and language, you can see how difficult it is. So I think it certainly impacts just on everyday life. It makes everything really hard because as, as we communicate, that, um, that's an integral part of being human. <laughs> um, so, and people just expect you to be able to follow what they're saying. That's, that's the way that I transmit ideas from my head to your head. And if that's a hard thing for you to follow, then, then it can make everyday life really hard. And then it also impacts a lot on children's education and their educational attainment because so much of education is based upon speech and language. You can imagine if you're sat in a classroom where there's lots of things going on and you have to follow a teacher and that's hard for you to do anyway with all those distractions and everything going on around you, it would be very easy to get lost very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, so it, it almost has like a compound effect throughout education. Yeah. In terms of um, DLD, what is our kind of current understanding of that disorder in terms of like its inheritance? Like, is it, is, are there known single genes that are heavily involved or, or is it like a variation across loads of different genes that are kind of impacting your ability to, to get this condition? So it's quite hard to say, because as I said, um, it's not like there's a definitive, this is DLD and this is not. Um, but in the majority of cases, we think it's what it follows what we call a complex inheritance pattern. Um, so that means that there are many, many genes involved and those genes together combine to confer your risk, if you like, of DLD. Um, having said that, in, in genetics, um, we're starting to understand that classifying disorders as complex or Mendelian, so single gene or multi-gene, um, that doesn't always follow as we would expect. So there are some cases of individuals and families where we see a single gene inheritance pattern that seems to be associated with quite often quite striking speech and language deficits. So a really famous example of this is the KE family. And they have a mutation in a gene known as FOXP2, which is a transcription factor. So it switches other genes on and off. Um, and the mutation prevents the transcription factor from working. And all the individuals who have that uh, particular variant have very particular difficulties with language, especially with producing language. So they have what we call orofacial dyspraxia, um, which means if you think about the movements that my lips and my tongue, and my face are making in order to allow me to speak, that's where the difficulties lie with those individuals that they have trouble with that motor control of the oral facial muscles. Yeah. What are some of the specific genomic tools that are actually being used to help investigate the, these disorders? So because we think the majority of cases are complex disorders, we're um, applying approaches like genome-wide association. Um, so we go and we collect very, very large cohorts of children who are affected by speech and language disorders and then look for common variations that are more common in those individuals than um, in individuals who don't have speech and language difficulties. Um, 
but this can be problematic in itself because to assess someone's speech and language um, ability is quite a hard thing to do uh, and takes a long time. So I think the largest GWASs to date have been kind of a couple of thousand individuals and that really doesn't give us the power that we need um, to look at, to identify the underlying genetic variants. So there's a big push in the field at the moment to think about, well, how can we combine existing data sets and how can we ramp up those numbers? Because in other disorders, we see increase in sample size it goes hand in hand with an increase in power. Yeah. How can more kind of advanced tools like whole genome sequencing kind of provide insights in terms of the potentially the role of like non-coding regions in, 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 in this disorder? Yeah, so as I said, um, we're, we apply the genome-wide association because we conceptualize DLD as a uh, complex disorder. Um, a whole genome sequencing approach can be really powerful if we think there are major gene effects. So if there's one or two genes that explain a large proportion of someone's risk. And current research shows us that even within a complex disorder, there are likely to be individuals out there who have kind of, they're more at the monogenic end. Um, and then there's individuals who, are, who have really, really complex genetic reasons for their difficulties. So we can try and identify those individuals who look kind of more at the monogenic end, and we can use whole genome sequencing approaches, which can help us to identify rare variations that contribute to the disorders. And then once we know the genes, we can kind of follow back and then look at those in the more complex cases. Um, and in, in that kind of study design, we really focus upon still the coding variations. So in those original families where we're doing whole genome sequencing, we can see that there are really, really rare variations that are likely to have a big effect upon the protein. And then we hypothesize that is um, that explains a certain amount of risk within that individual, but that gene will also be important in a more complex model as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of the non-coding variants, that's almost like another step further, um, but that would be good to be able to do. And I think as we start to understand the more um, monogenic effects and those major gene effects, then we can start to think about, well, what are the relationships between those genes and start to look at things like non-coding differences between those individuals. So far, what have been some of the kind of key findings and also kind of the key pathways that are, are kind of involved? So we have, there have been a handful of genes that have been identified in, for DLD. Um, it still doesn't really lead us to the pathway level quite yet. So one, one really big line of study um, has come from that case that I was talking about with the FOXP2 mutation by looking at what genes does FOXP2 regulate, we can then look at, well, what that tells us something about the FOXP2 wider pathway. And we see that genes within that FOXP2 wider pathway definitely contribute to speech and language disorders um, that are not uh, FOXP2, not because of FOXP2, but are FOXP2 related, if you like. Um, then we also see uh, pathways that we know are important in brain development and brain function. So things like calcium pathways that control calcium level levels um, have been shown to be important in speech and language development. And then the other interesting thing that we can do once we start to understand a little bit is to compare what might be the biological overlaps between DLD and other childhood and speech and language related disorders. So we often find within, a, within families that families where DLD is quite common also have difficult, also have individuals who are affected by things like dyslexia, ADHD. And this is all part of that complex genetic mechanism that I was talking about that variations that put you at a risk of DLD may also put you at a risk of dyslexia because there's this underlying 
bio, shared biological mechanism. Um, and we do see that. We see that there, there are likely to be shared biological reasons for these disorders that overlap. Each of the disorders will also have a slightly unique and different thing that is causing, say, DLD in this individual from what's causing dyslexia in this individual, but there is also this shared underlying component. So by understanding that, it also helps us to draw links between spoken language, written language, and other behaviours more generally. So it starts to help us to understand how, just how we develop and use speech and language. Has the kind of, has the role of the environment been explored like in detail in, 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 in this area? In terms of DLD, yes, because I, th I think originally people assumed that children who were struggling to develop speech and language, that would be explained by their environment. Um, but there have certainly been, we're, we know some environmental things that support children's speech and language development, and we know some things that challenge children's speech and language development. But it's certainly not true that all children who have DLD are brought up in that challenging environment or have some, there's anything environmental that completely explains DLD. Yeah. So say if like kind of our understanding progresses a bit more and we can identify um, the kind of key variants, how can these findings then ultimately be translated in, into the clinic and, and how can that kind of inform um, the educational system as well? Yeah, so um, I think this is different. When, when we think about genetics, we think, okay, we'll, we'll find out what, what's causing this disorder at a genetic level, and then we'll be able to diagnose individuals and we'll be able to treat them. Um, but I think for, thing, for more complex disorders like speech, like developmental language disorder, it's, it's not... Uh, because it because it's so complicated, it's not thinking about kind of diagnosing. It's more thinking about if we can understand why these children are having difficulties in the first place. And as I said, the biological mechanisms can help us to start thinking about those things. Then we might be able to find out better ways to earlier diagnose. So not by genetic testing, but more because we understand what what the early symptoms and signs are. Um, and better understand how do these overlap and what kind of things can we do to support children um, who are having these difficulties. Because as I said, the environment can have a big impact in terms of support. We already know that. We know speech and language therapists do a great job in guiding children, but if we can better understand why particular individuals are having difficulties, we can tailor that treatment better. And we can also design kind of educational um, programs to help children and to provide support where they need it most. I know earlier you mentioned one of the challenges being obviously getting like sample size for, for GUS studies. What are some of the other challenges in, in this area as well? Um, so I, th I think the main challenge is just how complicated it is. It's complicated at the behavioral level, um, at the neurological level, at the genetic level. Uh, and there are just so many things going on that just by looking at the genetics, that doesn't really provide a whole picture. So I think we have to take this holistic approach and that can be really hard um, in terms of study design. Think, thinking about how, how do we account for all these different things that are all going on simultaneously and are changing over time. Um, and, and I think that's why it's really important that we work together with all the different specialists in all the different areas and really take this collaborative research approach for, think, for complex disorders. I think that's really the key to generating translational research. Yeah. I know that some research has been done um, um, on, in like the Robinson Crusoe Island. Why is this area so significant and what is some of the kind of research that's, that's been done there? Yeah, so um, one of, in one of our studies, uh, we, we work with a special population known as the Robinson Crusoe 
population, and they're called that because they live on the Robinson Crusoe Island, which is like a tiny island off the coast of Chile in, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and we're particularly interested in those because in that population, there is a particularly high incidence of speech and language disorders. And that was first noted by some speech and language therapists uh, in Chile. Uh, and this is a nice example, actually, of that multidisciplinary approach that they were interested in characterizing and understanding, well, how did the environment have an impact upon children's speech and language development on the island? And then we saw their research and we said, actually, this would be also be really interesting from a genetic point of view, because, because they live in this very isolated population genetically, they're known as a founder population. So genetically, it's almost like a simplified genetic structure. Um, so by looking at the underlying genetics and combining that with the information that the speech and language um, specialists were collecting, it gives us greater power to identify the underlying genetic variations. So we've done um, some genetic sequencing and genetic association on the islanders, and that enabled us to find this genetic variation that was much more common in the individuals who had speech and language disorders than the individuals who didn't. And our research now is going on to look at, well, what does that genetic variation do and what might that tell us about speech and language development? So it's in a gene known as NFXL1, which is, is a transcription factor. So we've got a research, a research student in the department at the moment who is looking at what genes does that transcription factor control um, and what difference does that particular variation that we saw in the Robinson Crusoe population have upon that controlling pathway? Yeah. You're also um, studying people who, who talk backwards. Why, why is studying them so, so important? How can that inform um, speech and language as well? Yeah, so as I said right at the beginning, I'm, I'm interested in how everybody learns to use speech and language. If you think about what we're doing, it's just absolutely amazing that um, a baby is born into this world, there's all noises and everything going on around them, and it's all foreign, there's all um, those noise, this is new noise that they've not been exposed to before, and somehow out of that noise, the child is able to pick out speech and language, and with no prior knowledge of that speech and language, they're able to, in a relatively short time frame, understand, interpret what's being said to them, and express um, their own thoughts uh, using speech and language. And if you think about what's happening, it, it's just amazing that they can do that. Um, so one way is to one way to kind of leverage research in that area is to look at the disorders. But another way is also to look at the other extreme of speech and language use. Um, and so we've been doing this with a group of individuals who are who um, are very, very good at manipulating speech. So you can say a word to them and they'll immediately be able to reverse that word and say it backwards. OK, so they're called backwards speakers. Um, uh, so if you I don't know. I, I can't do this <laughs> but if you said the word lemonade then if you said that to, if you said to me reverse the word lemonade I get ed ed edda nom l okay so I've just reversed that word but that wasn't particularly impressive if you if you talk to someone who can backward speak and say to them reverse that word they would have done it just like that even if it was a word that they'd not previously heard of, even if it was a much harder word than lemonade. Um, and in fact, the people who we're working with can reverse entire sentences. So you can give them this quite long sentence and they'll literally reverse it word by word online, just, just like that. Did the boy kick the ball? Did Ediob kick Edlob? <laughs> the train was followed by the car. Was the car followed by the police? So Ed Rock Delaf Ib Ed Silap. So um at a language level, 
these people are really good at manipulating phonemes. So the phonemes are the speech sounds that make up words. And when you hear someone speaking, your brain is automatically um, um, translating entire words and streams of sound into these phonemes and mapping those sounds onto meanings in your brain. And we know that phoneme awareness is really a, a really important thing in terms of language development. We know that uh, children who have dyslexia really struggle with that mapping between speech sounds or between the written words and speech sounds in their brain. And children with developmental language disorders also have similar problems. Um, and these individuals are at the other end of the spectrum where they just find it really, really easy. When we talk to the backward speakers, we say, um, so how did you learn this? And they say, I, I could just do it. I just found that I could do it. So it's not like it was something that they trained themselves to do. Um, it, it's just something that they find really easy. So the idea behind that research project is that the reasons why they find it easy may be similar to the reasons why other people struggle and may be similar to the reasons why we, would, we don't even think about it. The majority of people in the middle don't even think about it. So if we can find genetic variations that contribute to their ability, it may help us to understand everybody else. Are people who can speak like multiple languages like and find it really easy to do that also at the end of the spectrum as well? And are they does that could that have like a genetic contribution as well? Because I'm so terrible. Like some people I know can speak multiple language and that and they're so good at yeah. it. And I can't I'm struggle to learn one language. <laughs> yes, I think that's a really nice example, another really nice example of kind of extreme ability that may help us to understand um, the more general uh, things that underlie speech and language. And there are there is actually a group in Holland who are looking at people who can speak multiple languages. It's probably, they probably find that easy for different reasons from the backward speakers. And I think there's probably also lots of other examples of these kind of extreme abilities that can tell us things about different aspects of speech and language. So we know learning a second language, you're using different parts of your brain from your, in, your mother tongue or your initial language. And if you think about the way that we learn, um, say, French or German at school, we do the, we think about that in a very different way from how we use English. Um, so there are different underlying pathways, but I think you're right. Some people still find that really, really easy, whereas other people find it a lot harder. And there's probably that's probably to do with those connections in the brain that are firing or not firing. Um, so I gave a really nice uh, demonstration of how I can't backwards speak. <laughs> I also find um, learning foreign languages quite challenging as well. It's really, really interesting. What are your kind of hopes um, for the future? Or what do you see the kind of future in this bit of field looking like? Um, so I'd like to think I'd like to think that the research um, into the disorders is going to help raise awareness of developmental language disorders so that more people will have heard about it and be aware of it. Help us to understand why some children struggle and help us to change the way that we, um, that we rely so much upon speech and language. So I guess being aware that some people, it might not be so easy for some people as others. Um, I guess that's the first step in, in helping those children. Um, and then the research more generally, just helping us to understand how, how we all have this amazing skill. And <laughs> I, I just find it fascinating that the majority of people use speech and language and we don't even think about what we're doing. But when you stop and think about it, you're like, that is pretty amazing. No, it's true because you're born and then you're like, how did I go from this baby that didn't, <laughs> doesn't know anything to being able to speak this made up thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's really interesting thank you so much for speaking to me today this topic is is so complex but it's also so interesting and also so important within, within society as well so thank you for sharing um, your insights that's great thank you for inviting me <laughs>
Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video, then make sure you check out some of our other videos in our series by subscribing below or going to our website, frontlinegenomics.com. I hope you enjoy.